Go ahead and get started here. So, uh, hello and welcome to this week's PlaceKey webinar. If it's all right with everyone, I'd like to take a moment to introduce PlaceKey and the PlaceKey community. PlaceKey is a free universal standard identifier for any physical place so that the data pertaining to those places can be shared across organizations easily. It's a movement of organizations and individuals that prize access to data. There's a community of data scientists and researchers who are part of PlaceKey community Slack channel, with a, a channel with over 7,000 members. And I will add a link to the community in the chat. I implore you to check it out and lots of great research has come from it and the people within the community make it an even better place. So I will add that here to the chat and we'll make sure it goes to uh, all panelists and attendees. And the Q&A will be done within that channel. So if you're interested in asking questions or continuing the conversation, please join there. With that being said, let's get into today's webinar. Today's presenters will be speaking on their most recent research on identifying factors affecting hospital capacity and predicting future hospital demand. For any questions or comments, please post them in the seminar channel of the aforementioned PlaceKey Slack channel. I will read them to the presenters at the end of their presentation or they will read them for themselves. For a 10 minute Q&A, if we run out of time, the discussion can continue within the Slack channel. And as a matter of fact, we encourage it. We are fortunate enough to have two presenters that I would be honored to introduce. Dr. Iluru is a professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Construction Engineering at the University of Central Florida. His research is geared towards the formulation and development of econometric models that allow him to mine the behavioral pattern embedded in data. Dr. Iluru has contributed to fundamental research in statistical and econometric model development with wide ranging applications in transportation and epidemiology. He works closely with researchers in environmental engineering, epidemiology, and medicine to study the impact of transportation externalities and COVID-19 on public health, focused on transmission and hospital usage. Dr. Iluru has received funding from prestigious agencies, including the National Academics um, National, National Cooperative Highway Research Program, National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Transportation, and uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research. He has also published more than 125 journal articles with his research receiving more than 6,500 citations. This is on Google Scholar. Dr. Boholmik is, is working as a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Civil, Environmental and Construction Engineering at the University of Central Florida with Dr. Iluru. He completed his PhD in spring of 2020 in civil engineering with a specialization in transpor transportation under the supervision of Dr. Iluru. His research interests are mainly geared towards the formulation and application of econometric and statistical models and analyzing multiple domains, including transportation and epidemiology. He recently worked on various COVID-19 related research projects, focusing on multiple aspects, including the COVID-19 transmission and mortality rate, as well as its impact on transportation sectors and the healthcare system. Thus far, he has authored and co-authored more than 20 papers, while 11 of them are already published in top tier journals. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Iluru and Dr. Bahomik. Take it away, guys. Uh, thank you, Jack, for such a nice introduction. And again, thanks the Place IQ community for giving us the opportunity to pre present our work in front of the bigger crowd. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining the seminar today. This is Tanmoy. So today we're gonna talk about one of my research where we develop a comprehensive framework to identify what are the critical factors that are, that are related to the hospitalization rate and then predicts the hospitalization demand into the future under different scenarios. I have authored this paper with my professor, Dr. Yuru, who is also present in this seminar right now. So let's go into the presentation. So as of today, we have already, we have already passed one year into the pandemic and the COVID virus is continuing to infect several people at an alarming rate all around the world. Now, United States alone is responsible for a quarter of these cases, nearing around 31 million, with death toll stopped to 550,000 people. These numbers have clearly created a heavy burden on our healthcare system because there was a time when hospital beds are running critically out of beds. In, th in this study, we are more interested on those hospitalization trends. What are the factors that are actually affecting those hospitalizations? And then develop a model and then based on those models, we will generate the future demand. What will happen on the ground? Is there any location that can run out of beds? And that is our primary objective of the research. So the left figure here actually shows the COVID trend in number of cases over the time period since the beginning of the pandemic. 
from the figure you can clearly see a huge peak in the middle three months from November to January 21. And after that, the case started to drop down very sharply, perhaps because of the rapid vaccination program that is going on in the country. But an worrying situation is in the current weeks, the curve, instead of going down further, it started to flatten or even more troubling that it started to increase. Around 18 to 20 states right now are already reported an 7% increase, weekly increase rate in their COVID, pace, COVID cases compared to the last weeks. So these facts clearly highlights that we are still are not out of danger. Same thing can be observed in the hospitalization rate too. So hospitals, the, in those peak period, hospitals are the epicenter of this battle as they are running out of beds. And US was dealing with the worst pandemic situation during those middle three months, especially from November to January. If you look at the hospitalization rate, you will see that hospitalization rate keeps hitting record high for several weeks in a row. To be specific, from the second week of December, more than 100,000 Americans are admitted to the hospital battling with this virus. And this trend continued for five weeks in a row. Same thing about the ICU units. In those peak period, there are around one third hospital across the country have more than 80% ICU units occupied. A simple example can be illustrated with the Los Angeles County. So with 10 million people in that county, there are times when only 100 beds are available to those 10 million people. So this fact clearly tells that how serious burden it was. It's a little bit time ago. And as the case started to increase again, many officials have already are also anticipating that there might be a possibility of another resurgence of cases. And if that happens, that will again create a heavy burden on our healthcare system. Another often neglected part of the COVID pandemic, it's its effect on the non-COVID patients. For them, it's not the virus that is threatening. For them, it's the exceeded hospital capacity. Because of the higher infection rate, more people are getting and more COVID patients are getting admitted to the hospitals. Therefore, there are not much room, there are not much room left in the hospitals, which actually shift the non-COVID patients out of the hospitals. However, even after January 15, the cases start to drop, and so as the hospitalizations. Interesting fact to notice: many hospitals have reported that they are not seeing any more normal people like they were before the pandemic. And the reason is, and the reason is people are scared of getting getting to the hospital because of because of being exposed to the virus because of their fear of getting exposed to the virus a research has been conducted in uk and the researcher concluded that they are already expecting a increase in the cancer death reduced to because of the reduced cancer service triggered by the covid pandemic so there these things clearly tells that the covid virus actually affecting both of these systems simultaneously and will only have a clear idea about the overall hospitalization trend, about the overall hospital demand, and about the overall hospital capacity if we consider both of these demand in the single framework. And that is exactly what our objective in this current study. A relaxing fact is right now, a rapid vaccination program is going on. And uh, the authorization of three vaccines actually help us to level up the pandemic a little bit. But at the same time, a new variant of the virus has been discovered, which has a very high transmissibility rate compared to the previous version. And the trend can actually be observed in the previous, previous week's results. The cases started to increase again in some state and so has the hospitalization. hospitalization. So these facts actually high, tells us that we are not out of danger yet and we need to continue maintain our guard in monitoring these cases and the resulting consequences. In that context, our objective of the study is to examine the overall hospitalization. So within hospitalization, we focused on two things. First, how many hospital beds are occupied? And second, how many ICU units are occupied? Another dimension we add is we not, we not only focused on only the COVID patients, but also focused on the non-COVID patients too. So our analysis of interest is, okay, how many hospital beds are occupied by both COVID and non-COVID patients? and same for the ICU units. The reason is twofold. First, if we consider both COVID and non-COVID demand in a hospital, only then we'll have a clear idea what is going on in the hospital, how many beds are actually available. So we can make sure if something unexpected happened, enough beds are available there, 
until the threat of the virus is reduced. Second thing is, through our framework, we can evaluate the hospital system recovery. The, th the important thing to note is, this recovery will only occur once the required treatment by the non-COVID patient is addressed. The non-COVID, because of the influx of the COVID patients, the non-COVID patients are getting shifted out from the hospitals. They are forced to delay their required treatments. For example, there are some people who are suffering from pre-existing condition like cancer or heart disease. They are required their treatments, but because of the influx of COVID hospitalizations, they are forced to delay their treatments. So the hospital fully recovery system will only occur once these treatments are addressed. In the unit, in the time of analysis, there are clearly a mismatch because higher COVID admission means lower non-COVID patients in the hospitals. And this mismatch can only be met if we can get back to the exact same spot at it was at, as it was before the pandemic. That is why considering both of this demand, both of this system, both of this COVID and non-COVID patient in a single frame, framework is of utter importance. And that is exactly what we conducted in this study. So the main, con so we contributed along four dimensions throughout our framework. First, as I already mentioned, we consider both COVID and non-COVID demand because it is important to consider both of the system to understand and reflect the full hospital capacity. Second is our unit of analysis. There are a lot of research has been going on who, who, who examine the COVID infection rate or the COVID mortality rate. However, there are very limited amount of research focusing on the hospitalization trend. Even within this research, they focused on aggregate level data. And the reason is till now the data was not available. So is the aggregate level model wrong? No, it is not. But the problem was if we plan something at an aggregate level, let's say we do our analysis at a state level. Now planning something at a state level will require substantial input, substantial money, and a lot of efforts. Another thing is maybe we found one state is bad, like they run out of, they will run out of capacity in future if something unexpected happened. Now that state contains 50 counties. So if the that state is bad, that doesn't represent that all the 50 counties are doing bad. Maybe 40 of them are doing good, well under the capacity, and 10 are, and 10 counties are doing so bad. That is what is reflected by the state level measures. So that is why we need to divide in, we need to zero in to a final resolution as possible. And that is exactly what we achieved in our analysis. We consider our analysis at a county level. And based on that, we identify, okay, which counties requires our attention at its most, which counties might go out of capacity. We will identify those counties and then finally plan some infrastructure support. For example, maybe we can increase the nursing or plan or build some healthcare infrastructure for those counties only it will reduce the complexity and the planning level efforts. The third contribution is our consideration of the up-to-date data. Majority of the earlier studies, whichever has the models for hospitalizations focused up to the month of August. Whereas in the first slide, I already showed that the several peaks has been occurred, especially in the middle three months from November to January. So considering the up-to-date data will result in a more insightful model and that is exactly what we did in this current research and finally we went through a lot of literature review and a lot of statistics and find out okay what are the possible factors that can be related with the hospitalizations and then finally list this comprehensive list of factors and use that in our model our primary and final objective our once most important objective is, is to generate prediction. Our idea is to show okay, what will happen in future. But that is why we generate some COVID scenarios, like everything is going as planned. The rapid vac the vaccination program is going according to the plan and we will have a control of the pandemic by the end of July or even before. Or something unexpected happened. We, we might experience another resurgence and the car start to move in the wrong direction. If that happens, what will happen to the hospitalizations and in response to its capacity? What are the locations that might go out of base? This is our final objective. So as I already mentioned, a recent data was available by the Department of Health and Human Service, which provide information at the hospital level itself. So they provide information at a hospital, how many COVID patients had been admitted to the hospitals 
and how many non covid patients has been admitted to the hospitals too they also provide information for the icu units too this information has been reported from july 31st to present and also they provide the weekly level data so they provide what are the admission or hospitalization rate at a week level they take the summation and then they provide this measures the so the information was provided for around 5000 hospital covering 2400 counties within 51 states however as our level unit of analysis at the county level we aggregate all the information at the county level so we identify which hospital located to each county for example let's say we found that in a county we have three hospitals we take the sum of every measure and then generate the different final dependent variables for our analysis in terms of independent variables as i already mentioned we select a very comprehensive list so total five broad categories the first one is the most obvious one the covid related factors the covid infection rate but the important thing to notice the current week infection rate will not have any effect on the current week hospitalization because if a person gets exposed to the virus it will take around 3 to 5 days to build the symptoms and then another 5 to 3 to 6 days to become severely ill and hence become hospitalized in the hospital so there is always a 6 to 14 days gap between being exposed to the virus and finally being hospitalized so that is why we cannot use the current week infection rate to the current week model so we use a lagged variable so the one week lag means okay what is the infection rate previous week the two weeks lag means what is the infect covid infection rate is that two weeks ago another thing we capture is we estimate the past three week moving average and we see what is going on in the last week is the trend is in a increasing behavior or does it have a decreasing behavior and then for use that variable as a predictor in our model too the second obvious variable is the mobility trends the mobility trends means okay in that county how many gatherings have been occurred how many in that county people are exposed to how many people because higher exposure means higher chance of getting infected and hence the higher hospitalization so that's why you consider that also the third one is is the health indicators because a lot of study has showed if a person suffers from pre-existing conditions like heart disease diabetes or obesity he will have a very high chance of getting severely ill once being infected with the virus so we consider this information also another important thing is these are the variables which will contribute to the non covid patients too because if if you think like if a county has higher number of people suffering from pre existing disease that county will have higher number of non covid patients in the hospitals or in the icu units that is why you consider this factors also the fourth one is the demographics here we consider like what are the proportion of people in the county by age racial community or gender and finally you consider some regional and temporal factors so after considering the previous four maybe there is something specific to that region itself that is actually impact the increasing hospital increasing or decreasing hospitalization for example there was a time when it was predicted that Colder regions will have higher higher infection rate, higher COVID infection rate. Though this information is not valid now, but the point I want to make is maybe something related to the region itself. Same with the temporal trend. For example, maybe something is related to the holidays itself. Maybe something happened after the last wave. So we use this information as a dummy variable, and we want to see if that information is come out of any significance. So in summary, these five categories we use in our model estimation. So after getting all the data, it's time, it's the, we prepare the data. So the mobility data we consider, this information is available for around 2000 counties. However, within these 2000 counties, around 250 doesn't have any hospitals at all. So there is no point of including these counties in the model. So finally, we end up with 1765 counties. But the important thing to notice, this selected counties is actually covers more than of 97% US population and the COVID-19 cases. So that tells, that tells us that whatever the counties we didn't select, they are basically either unwanted areas or deserted island or deserted land. In terms of temporal selection, we selected 21 weeks of data starting from August 28 to January 22nd. Now, though the data was available from July 31st, 
all the hospitals do not report the data from the initial states. So uh, we identify what are what are the list date that we can select from when the hospitals start to report the data, and that is August 28. And this analysis has been conducted around one and a half months ago or two months ago around. So at that time, the analysis, we finished the analysis, I think on January 29th or 30th. And at that time, the latest data available was up to January 22nd. And that's why we select that data. In terms of dependent variable, as I already discussed, total four dependent variables we consider, the overall hospitalization rate and ICU uses rate, but both COVID and non-COVID patients. As all of these variables are continuous in nature, we use the linear regression system for our model estimation. So this is an overall summary of the data, this data presentation or data visualization about what is going on in the ground at that time period. So we, I present in this slide, we present the IC users rate and the hospital bed users rate per 100,000 population. In all of these figures, the dashed horizontal lines presents the hospital, the capacity, like in the top is presents the ICU capacity, in the bottom is presents the hospital bed capacity. The bigger curve presents the overall hospitalizations or the ICU users rate, and the lower curve presents only because of the COVID patients. So if we want to, if, so if we want to describe the top two figures, it means the orange line presents what are the occupancy of the hospital ICU units by the COVID patients only. And the euro lines presents what are the total occupancy in the ICU units itself. So we compute these measures across all the regions. However, due to lack of space, I am just presenting the at the national level and at the regional level for only for the West region. So if you can see, we can clearly see in the West region on January 15, the situation was very close to the capacity. Actually, at that time period, the availability of the ICU units comes down to 10%. That means only three beds are available to 100,000 people. So these facts clearly highlight that how serious the issue once upon a, well, a, a couple of months ago, how serious the issue was. The dark blue line here presents the COVID cases trend, which is exactly almost similar to what I presented in the first slide. And the pink line presents the mobility trends. If you can see the pink line, you can see that the mobility trends are having an ups and downs, but pretty much in that similar range, unless a sudden spike in the mid of December. And this is perhaps because of the holiday, holiday season. Maybe people lock down their restrictions, go to the travel to their loved ones, and hence the, hence the surge in the exposure. So now we have prepared everything. We have identified what are the factors that can be affected. We have some ideas and now it's time to estimate our model. And this is our estimation results. So in this table, I present all the four dependent variables in the same table. There are two triangles I use. The first one is the upward triangles, which, re which reflects the positive impact. The downward triangles implies the negative impact. So for instance, if I select this variable to describe is the, what is the infection rate in two weeks ago? And these variables tells if we have higher infection rate two weeks ago, we'll have an increased number of hospitalizations by the COVID patients. At the same time, the non-COVID patient, non-COVID hospitalization will decrease. So this variable is a perfect example to show how a, sim a single, how the COVID is actually increasing the COVID hospitalization and at the same time, shifting the non-COVID patients out of the hospitals. Same thing can be captured in the ICU units too. With the cross signs, I present the interaction terms. So basically I present, okay, this variable might have differential impact across different regions. The two triangles here presents, the later one presents the overall impact, the first one presents the sensitivity. So for example, if we describe this variable, it says in the OS region, if the infection rate was higher, still the hospitalization will increase for COVID patients, but at a lesser magnitude compared to other regions. So the effect is still positive, but with a lower sensitivity. Another interesting variable is this one. So compared to the past three weeks, if we, we are in the increasing trend, that means if we have, if the, if the past week infection rate is higher than the moving average, we'll have a higher hospitalization rate, which is expected, which is very intuitive. So all of these results are, in, are actually in line with previous findings. 
though I wanted to discuss everything very briefly, but due to lack of time issue, I couldn't. So if any one of you any, have any questions, please feel free to ask me after the presentation. And even if I cannot, we cannot cover after the presentation, we, I will share our email address or we will chat in the Slack community. And we'll, I will be very happy to answer anything I can clarify or any questions I can answer. So the next one is, again, everything is in expected trends based on the previous findings. So for example, let's say the health indicators, we find that now this is something we need, we, I want to focus on because let's say the cardiovascular patients, this variable represents if a county has higher number of cardiovascular patients, that county have higher number of COVID hospitalized patients too. At the same time, those counties also have non-COVID patients Non, increased number of non-COVID patients too. And this is expected because people, because in the ICU units, the people who are suffer from pre-existing conditions, they have had possibility of being admitted to the ICU units, even if diagnosed with COVID-19 and even without. So maybe these are the counties which can perform bad because same variable is increasing both of these. That means the overall hospitalization or ICU demand will increase and it might go out of the capacity. However, we cannot say for certain because, but what I want to make a point is maybe this, maybe that this variable is affecting both of these simultaneously in the same trend. So maybe these are the counties we can focus on, but we'll decide after controlling all the variables, which I will present in a very short time. So within the special factor, again, we found like number of airports have a positive impact. That means if we have higher number of airports in a country, that means more, more traveling is going on and off. And so is the higher hospitalization by the COVID patients because there is a high chance of getting infected with the virus. So again, I'm just going to skip over quickly about the results because of the time issue. So now we developed our model, developed our model. And this figure actually tells the main advantage of our model system. As we estimate our model at the final resolution, that means county, now, if anyone is interested and tells me, okay, I wanted the measure at a state level, I can always go to the top directions anytime I want. I, what we have to do is we just have to miss some, aggregate the measure at those levels. So from the county, we can go to the state level measures. From the state, you can go to the region level measures or even further at the national level measures. So that is the main advantage. Now, if we start our analysis at the state level, we can never go down. So that is, that is the main advantage of starting a model in the final resolution, in a final resolution possible. So now comes to our final and most important objective. Now we want to predict in the, based on our model specification, we want to predict into the future under different scenarios. Therefore, we consider total two scenarios. The first one is the pessimistic scenario and the second one is the optimistic scenario. In the pessimistic scenario, we consider, okay, the two scenarios we consider. First one is peak and valley. Here we, cons here we assume like, we will have a series of ups and downs of COVID cases, but still high until the end of July. The second one, and this one should, will be the worst possible scenario that can happen that based on the experts expertise, maybe there is an, another resurgence will occur. Now, someone might, in, from the audience, someone might say that we predict that a resurgence will occur in the mid of March thing I want to mention is these things we assume we didn't, we didn't predict at all. Based on these scenarios, we'll predict the hospital capacities, hospital de hospitalization demand. Now, in when we finished this analysis, it was January, it was the end of January. So that's why you say, okay, maybe something will happen by mid of March. So the idea was, yes, was to insight, provide insight on if a resurgence occurs, so if it doesn't occur now, if it occurs less than July, whatever I am going to present in the next couple of slides, for those scenarios, the figure will look exactly the same, but just a shifting will occur by two or three months. So now, I am, now if we show that something unexpected, something bad will happen in March, if it will happen in July, the same figure will follow on in the July month. Then within the optimistic scenario, we, still, we consider like the case start to decline in a slow burn process, not diminishing fully, fully, but by the end of July, we'll have a control on the pandemic. And the last one, 
is the best condition you can ever have. That everything is going as planned. The vaccination program is working very efficiently, and we get a complete control of the pandemic by the end of July or even before. Now, based on these four scenarios, we'll look how the hospitalization, hospital demand, and ICU demand will change. Before proceeding, another thing we have to assume is the exposure, the mobility trends. So, to keep everything simple, we assume a sim same similar trend across all the four scenarios. So, this slide presents the hospital capacity in terms of hospital bed and the hospitalization demand. So, the dashed line presents the overall hospitalization demand by summing up both COVID and non-COVID demand. And the solid line here presents the hospital capacity. Now, if we look at the national level picture, we are well below the capacity. So we don't have to worry at all. And this slide actually reflects our hypothesis that looking at the aggregate level doesn't always reflect the true picture. For example, if I am interested in the national, that means we are good, we don't need to do anything. But look at the regional level. All the three regions are doing almost good, but in the Northeast region, in terms of hospital beds for the pessimistic scenario, the demand actually is near around 90%, especially for the unexpected spike, 90% or even more than 95, 90% of the capacity. So the resurgence, we, we assume if we increase a little bit, in that region, the capacity will be exceeded. Capacity will be extended and there will be shortage of bed. Same thing can be observed in the ICU, ICU analysis too. In the OS region, around 95% capacities are already occupied. We'll have only 5% left. Now we identify, okay, these two regions might be, we need to focus on. But again, focusing on a region might not reflect two picture. Maybe all the states are not doing bad. That is why we, far, we dig deeper into the state level analysis. And this is our results. Now this slide only presents the results for the last month. So basically the last one we use is until July. So this is, this is our predictions for the month of July. Now for the unexpected peak, the worst situation was actually occurred on the month of March based on our assumption. So if we consider the month of March, this is, though this is for July, if we consider for month of March, we find a consistent findings that all the bigger states are actually performing bad, like California, Florida, Georgia, or New York. These are the states which might go out of capacity in under the pessimistic scenarios. Under optimistic, we are always good, so we don't need to worry at all. So now we identify these four states, or five, or four, not four actually, four to seven states. Now, again, within this just maybe not all counties are doing bad. So now we go to the further disaggregate analysis within, so for example, we select the California. So in California, you have to 558 counties and it presents the peak and valley and rapid vaccination scenario. And the figure is as follows. In the peak and valley scenario, around nine counties have more than 90% capacity occupied, out of which seven actually exceeded the capacities. Whereas in the rapid vaccination, almost majority of them are performing good. Around two are still nothing is exceeded the capacity. Only around two in terms of hospital beds are closed are around 90% of the capacity. The idea was to now we identify, okay, these are the counties that needs our attention, that needs an, needs an attention. So if something unexpected happened, if the cases again moving, start moving in the wrong direction, maybe we can prioritize these counties. We can build for some infrastructure or we can increase some nursing in those counties. Or another thing we can, we can propose is maybe we can say vaccinate these counties first and the neighboring counties of these counties and then focus on others and then focus on others. So by doing that, we can at least reduce some consequences or as a, a little bit exact Compared to the compared to the condition uh, situation we have, especially in the last December. Same thing for Florida, that we identify these counties around eight counties in the pessimistic peak and valley scenario is going out of capacity. So we identify these counties and we can plan for some plan something ahead for these counties. So this in this figure we present okay in a country, in the whole country, how many counties is performing bad? So this is the figure we need to finally focus on. So to figure it out, we consider two, two measures. One, 
what are the percentage of counties that have over 90% capacity uh, occupancy rate considering both covid and non covid patients including both hospital and icu beds and the second one is okay what are the percentage of counties that have at least more than 25% covid 19 hospitalization because looking at the research and the data we will find that that the covid admission rate is around 15 to 20% when it starts to increase after it is uh, when it starts to go past 20% it's a big issue and if it starts to go past 25% that means a very very big concern so as you as we can all see there is a huge deviation between the pessimistic and the optimistic scenario at least a deviation of 10 to 25% deviation if we consider all the four figures so based on these figures we can know okay these are the found counties that are doing bad and these are the counties which require our attention which require some planning so in summary in our study we developed a skeleton framework to examine the overall hospitalization and ICU as I said. And this framework can always, the idea was to generate some scenario and under COVID scenarios, and under those COVID scenarios, find out how the hospital demand and hospital capacity will react. This framework is, can always be updated with a new level data. And using our specification or our model system, we can always identify the vulnerable locations. However, there are some still some limitations. For example, we consider the same exposure scenarios. Now, the best thing to do is maybe we consider four different exposure scenarios for four different COVID conditions. Combine this with the combining these two scenarios, so we'll end up with sixteen scenarios, and then find out okay what are the or situ situation that can happen and what will how the hospital train hospitalization train in terms of the capacity will change in the, in respect to those scenarios. So that can be an excellent avenue for future research so thank you everyone so the highlighted one is the one that i just presented we also have another paper on covid 19 where we examine the county level covid infection and mortality rate so if anyone or any one of you have any questions i'll be very glad to answer that even if we cannot cover this is our email address me and my professor so you, we can check we can chat in the slack community too and we'll be very happy to clarify any unclarified questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. And I have to, before we even start the q and I have to say your graphs, they're, they're amazing. I especially like the, uh, the arrow ones, the up and down, that made everything so much easier to read. So great job there. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I mean, until people start asking questions, I put one in the seminars if you guys want to take that. And I actually have I have a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, I'll go ahead and read that one for you. So have you considered trying to control for false positive COVID diagnosis? So you mentioned that there was there was non COVID cases that were uh, decreasing, but uh, is it possible that the non COVID patients are sometimes being classified as COVID? So in the hospital data that is reported by the uh, DHH, so they also provide information on the false report. Yes, yes, he, you are right. They also report and the COVID and non-COVID patient demand that we consider that is ignoring those false reports. So they have, a, they have a clear separate column that tells that these variables are generated ignoring the false report. Interesting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I had another one that I'll post in here. So you mentioned that there was um, there was more deadly strains and more more contagious strains coming out. And specifically, what comes to mind is the strain from Brazil, which is the P1 strain. Um, are does the does the rapid vaccination or the most positive outlook that you were looking at take the P1 strain into account? No. In the rapid vaccination, we said. Before the P1, so in the rapid vaccination, we didn't take in, in that account because that is already accounted in the op pessimistic scenario because the peak and value the, or the unexpected spike, we assume that this will happen because of the, either the new covariance, the new variance, or something happened. But, but in the rapid vaccination program, we didn't consider that because if you think we consider four scenarios separately. 
So within these four scenarios, we consider what is happening in the rapid vaccination, if vaccination going as planned, and what is happening if a variant started to infect people at an alarming rate. But within a scenario, we didn't combine. I gotcha. Okay. Um, I think I think that there's a, maybe J and J covers um, the new the new strains, but I don't think the other ones do. So they have to release a booster or something. So I was curious if that was in the analysis. But thank you. Um, okay. Still waiting. Again, guys, if you have any questions, put them in the seminars channel for the Slack. Um, if you guys are okay, I've got another question for you. Um, so. You looked at the county level analysis of COVID cases, and I was curious if you saw in terms of capacity, if there was some correlation with uh, the financial standing of those counties. So if, and basically were, were poor areas more likely to, to reach capacity or was it richer areas or was there any correlation at all? Did you, did you have a chance to look at that? Uh, yes. So basically we use the income variable too in our analysis. I don't know if I present it in the table, but yes, we use the income variable too. And we we didn't find anything significant for the income variable. So that is why we didn't show it in the table, but we use the income variable to capture those correlation about like poor counties or richer counties and how the hospitalization will change. But unfortunately that variable doesn't come as significant. Again, gotcha. we, we should notice that we are using health indicators. Those health indicators sometimes reflect poorer communities also. So uh, higher incidence of obesity, heart disease, those are likely to be in communities where some of the lower income households reside. So they, so all of them won't come sig uh, significant in the model at the same time. So there are some correlations between data. So we cannot, you, you will see some surrogate measures such as health indicators uh, showing up instead of the actual income. I see. All right. So because of the actual health if problems that we were seeing, you could actually maybe draw that conclusion. Yes. Interesting. Um, and I mean, we're, we're almost at our last leg of time here, but uh, I was curious what the future, like, are you planning to continue this as, as the vaccinations roll out? And like we saw, for instance, J and J just lost something like 15 million mm -hmm. vaccines. I'm curious if you're planning to continue this research and update it uh, as, as this year goes on. Yes, we will definitely. We will definitely update our model based on the recent data. That's that's what we have in our plan. Amazing. All right. So I look forward to seeing that for sure. Um, all right. So we're basically at the end of our time here, but I want to thank you guys so very much for, for agreeing to do this and to speaking at this webinar. Um, and again, for everyone in the community, if you have any questions or you would like to continue this conversation, please do so in the seminars channel. And you've also added your emails here. Um, both of you have so that if there's any outreach or anything, they can reach you there, correct? Yes. Perfect. All right. Thanks again, guys. And I hope everyone has, uh, has a good time and stay safe. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Take care. Thank you.